Hey, it's Mike Can. Wanted to talk about the video that uh, I've come across from the agents that testified, the whistleblowers uh, from the ATF that talked about Operation Fast and Furious. This testimony really does show that Fast and Furious was unlike all other ATF operations and uh, pretty much any law enforcement operation. You can see that this Operation Fast and Furious from the testimony of the ATF whistleblowers is very similar to some other crazy federal operations like um, let's say maybe co co uh, cocaine contra Iran contra um, you know similar to the FBI in Boston where they let uh, Whitey Bulger kill people you know these these types of operations you have to question and the Attorney General and the, and the President of the United States are blocking the Congress from finding out what went wrong why it happened how to correct it how to stop it in the future people have been killed Brian Terry was killed yet the uh, the Attorney General and the President don't seem to want to punish anyone. They don't seem to want to let the American public know why this happened, how we can stop it. I don't get it. If they didn't do anything wrong, what do they have to hide? Check out the testimony and tell me, how could you not investigate this? How could you not let this see the light of day? There's only one explanation in my point, is that they are trying to destabilize Mexico. And, uh, I mean, what, what other conclusion could I draw? From the cover-up. If you're not, if you don't have anything to cover up, let us know who who approved this operation, who sent out the fraudulent documents trying to cover it up. These are simple questions that need to be answered by the attorney general. An idea of the size and scope, and we're talking about thousands of guns knowingly going uh, south, so to speak. In your normal course of business, if you thought that there was a straw purchase happening, how many guns would kind of push you over the threshold to say we better stop that? Well, sir, I can tell you this. Prior to my arriving in Phoenix in December 2009, my entire career we have never walked a firearm. And as a matter of fact, even if one had gotten away from us, if it was only a prop which had been mechanically engineered so that it could not effectively fire around, even if that got away from us, no one went home until we got it back. Even just one gun? Yes, sir. And in this case, we have thousands of guns. Now, what, what, was, what was the over... What was the goal here. I mean, so I, I can tell you what I was told. I was told that the goal is to ultimately target and bring an entire cartel to prosecution. But how were they going to do that? I mean, the, car the suspected cartels were in Mexico, were they not? Yes, sir, they were. And I have no idea how they planned to do that by this operation or, or how it was designed to function. So what, was it the goal to knowingly and intentionally allow these guns to go into Mexico? As, uh, was that the ultimate goal? Not as explained to me. Was that part of, was that the rules in play to achieve what the goal that they had explained? Yes. We were mandated, let these guns go. Make no mistake, there was not a time we were out there on surveillance where we didn't have the forethought that these were going to be recovered in crimes. The next time we became aware of these guns would be when they were recovered at their final crime. Not whatever crime they might have done. It was the last crime that they commit, that they're, not they commit, but the person who has them commit, that they're recovered in. There may be nine or ten that the cartels have perpetrated with those firearms prior to that date, but that recovery date is when we'll learn about it. So ultimately, what was the main goal, as explained to me, was to get a cartel. The mission, what we were doing, what we were ordered to do every day, was watch these, the same guys, buy the same guns from the same dealers who we told to make the sales, and then we'd sit back and wait for the traces. And when they came through from places in Mexico where it was definitively related to cartels, they were giddy. They thought that that justified, that, that, that created their nexus from this straw purchaser to the cartel. However, there's not a rookie police officer in this country that can explain to you how we're going to make a case on them with that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Special Agent Canino, I just think I just heard Special Agent Newell say that you knew about uh, this gun walking. Okay, can you please? Uh... Yes, sir. I want to make it perfectly clear to you, the American people, the Mexican government, my family, my friends, at no time ever did I know that ATF agents were following known suspected gun traffickers, one of which 
bought 700 guns, and we knew about his guns showing up in Mexico six weeks after we opened up that investigation. Never, ever did I, would I imagine that we were letting that happen. We have 4,000 investigations, plus or minus, with uh, Mexico, uh, U.S. Nexus. There were guns coming in. That's trafficking. The guns are coming into Mexico. I have no clue that we were allowing these guys to operate like this. Like Mr. Gowdy said, we didn't even bother. We, there was no interdiction. To start any case, you have to, you have a toolbox. We have classes. Jose Wall teaches those trafficking classes. I've been to them. It's like building a house. You start from the bottom and you try to work your set, way up. You know, at one point, you're only going to go reach so far. And then you come in and you have a meeting and you say, okay, how can we advance this? You meet with the U.S. Attorney. From what I see here, none of this was done. Or if it was, it wasn't very effective. So when, when did you first realize that the gun walking allegations were true? April. Of this year? I, when, yes, April. I mean, I was starting to lean that way, and then I was at ATF Bureau headquarters in April for a meeting, and I sat down with Mr. Ledman, and uh, he convinced me. Okay. Did you come across any specific evidence to prove that ATF had taken part in these actions? One more time, sorry. Did you come across any specific evidence to prove that ATF had taken part in these actions? Well, from, his, from the totality of the circumstances and then, you know, speaking with different agents and speaking with Mr. Ledman, um, yeah, and, you know, the guns showing up in Mexico. Um, Did you review any documents or anything? I, you know, sir, I, when I visited Mr. Ledman, um, I saw, uh, I took a look at the management log, and um, if I read it correctly, uh, there were three instances in the first two pages where um, we walk away from guns. At that point, I was so disgusted, I didn't even want to look at the case file anymore. And when was that? That was in mid-April or so but, well, of this year. What, why were you so upset with this information? Because it goes against everything we're taught. I mean, you, like I was explaining earlier, you don't do that. We're not taught to do that. From the first day we walk into the academy, all the way till you leave this job, like, like Darren said. That's, it's not a recognized investigative technique. This, like I said, this is not a special case. This is just a trafficking case that we do. This is what we do, you know, we, amongst other things, but trafficking is, is what we do, especially on the southwest border. This, was, this wasn't a one of. This wasn't a who done it. This was, you know, this just, was a ground ball. Just a basic game, basic, basic case. <laughs> yeah. What you do every day. Hmm. Exactly. M Ms. Special Agent Newell, um, do you know who Kevin O'Reilly is? Yes, sir. What's the nature of your relationship with him? I have known Kevin for, I would say, probably 10, 12 years. Uh, how often do you communicate with him? Oh, I haven't communicated with him in a while, but probably three or four times a year or something like that, or maybe, maybe more, depending on him reaching out to me. Isn't it a little bit unusual for a special agent in charge of an ATF field division to have direct email contact with the national security staff at the White House? He's, he's a friend of mine. How many times did you talk to him about this case? The specifics of this case? Uh, I, don't think I, I, mean, the, I don't think I had one specific conversation with him about the specifics of this case. Okay. Uh, who or would the gentleman allow me to? A, a whole bunch of things that I could say about what you just did, and maybe this is the way you do things from, you know, in Idaho or wherever you are from. Um, but understand something. What I have done, I am proud of the work that I have done. General, you are not a good witness. A good witness answers the question asked. So let's go back again. Have you and your attorneys produced internally the materials responsive? In other words, have you taken the time to look up our subpoena and find out what material you have responsive to it, or you've simply invented a privilege that doesn't exist? 
you saying internally have we internally have you sure. pulled all that information we've looked at two hundred forty custodians we have processed millions of electronic records and we reviewed over one hundred forty thousand documents and produced to you about seventy six hundred so one hundred forty thousand documents how many documents are responsive but you are withholding at this time but we've produced 7,600. The Look, I don't want to hear about the 7,600. Why won't you let Patrick Cunningham, the head of the criminal division in Phoenix, and uh, Emery Hurley uh, come and uh, align prosecutor, why won't you let them come and talk to the committee? If you can't let them do it publicly, you ought to let them do it in, in a private setting. Why won't you let them do that? Well, a couple of things. Um, just for the record, I was only a deputy attorney general for four years. Um, well, okay, four years. It seemed years. like six. Um, it seemed like longer than that for me. Well, all right, longer than six for me as well then. Um, when one of the other realities... Uh, would that, the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, since Mr. Cunningham has now taken the fifth, I, I would say none of us have that direct authority. But to add to the gentleman's question, would you make all testimony and information on Mr. Cunningham immediately available to us, unredacted, so we may evaluate to a great extent what you know about why he took the fifth? Uh, go ahead. I yield back. Well, in terms of making available, um, I'm not sure where you get the number of, of 93,000 documents. The redactions that have occurred are only uh, because there are things that are either not relevant or are protected uh, by grand jury secrecy rules, um, court orders that have sealed material. We have provided to this committee material that is relevant and only redacted that which is necessary and have there's a key that tells you why something was redacted. With regard to the two people you've talked about, um, Hurley, uh, Mr. Hurley is a, a line prosecutor and we never make line prosecutors um, available that is, every attorney general that I know has followed that policy. Mr. Cunningham no longer works in the Justice Department, and so I don't have the ability to compel him um, to testify. He left the Justice Department, I think, this past Monday or last Friday. Did, did you, you ask him to leave, I guess, did you? No. Oh, you didn't? No. He left on his own after he took the Fifth Amendment? He had planned to leave well before uh, he invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege to take a job in private practice or at a company. Uh, as I understand it, the IG has uh, 80,000 documents, and you've given us 6,000. So uh, whether, you're, whether we're talking about 93 documents or 80,000, this committee has asked for those and has not gotten them. And it appears as though we're being stonewalled, and uh, uh, there's something that's being hidden. Let me ask you another question. Have you apologized personally to the whistleblowers who were, in effect, called liars by those within your own agency? when we now know they were telling the truth, and uh, we wouldn't know uh, any of this today if they hadn't come forward, and I'm talking about people like John Dodson, who's here today, and uh, Peter Forselli. Have you apologized to them personally? I have not apologized to them. I've spoke to Mr. Dodson, um, Agent Dodson, at the beginning of the hearing when the chairman was kind enough to bring him by. I gave him my telephone number and told him to give me a call if he wants to talk about the way he... Give you a call? Give me a call. Why don't you call him and apologize? Because you're the Attorney General of the United States, and you're in charge of these people, and they were, in effect, called liars, and they were telling the truth. And I think as the head of that agency, it should be your responsibility to say, hey, guys, I'm sorry that you were called liars when you did tell the truth. Uh, I'm not aware of them being called liars, but beyond that, um, what we've tried to do is treat them with respect. I don't think any adverse action has been taken against any of the people who came here and testified before um, this committee. To the extent that there are concerns that Mr. Dawson has, I'd be more than glad to talk to him about them. I will note, however, that he's had a meeting with the acting director of ATF, and I think he has expressed uh, whatever his thoughts were, at least at that time. If that's not been sufficient, as I said, I'm more than glad to have a conversation with him. I, I wish you would call him. The gentleman's time has expired. Did you want to answer on the Cunningham question of materials that in your possession now that he has left under this cloud? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was under a cloud, but anyway, he... Um, taking the fifth not a cloud? I don't know why he took the fifth. Um, there are a variety of reasons, not the least of which was that uh, apparently there was a report issued by this committee or a statement by this committee that he had acted inappropriately. I don't know, if, I don't know why he invoked the fifth amendment, his Fifth Amendment privilege. That is certainly his right as an American citizen. Um, we have provided already 
153 documents with regard to Mr. Cunningham that entails about 387 pages of material. We will continue to look at that material and to the extent that there is information that is relevant, we will provide it to the committee. I thank you. We now recognize the other former chairman of the committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Those that have sealed material, we have provided to this committee material that is relevant and only redacted that which is necessary and have there is a key that tells you why something was redacted. With regard to the two people you have talked about, um, Hurley, uh, Mr. Hurley is a, a line prosecutor, and we never make line prosecutors um, available. That is, every Attorney General that I know has followed that policy. Mr. Cunningham no longer works in the Justice Department, and so I don't have the ability to compel him um, to testify. He left the Justice Department, I think, this past Monday or last did, Friday. Did you, you ask him to leave, I guess, did you? No. Oh, you didn't? No. He left on his own after he took the Fifth Amendment? He had planned to leave well before uh, he invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege to take a job in private practice or at a company. A, a whole bunch of things that I could say about what you just did, and maybe this is the way you do things from, you know, in Idaho or wherever you are from. Um, but understand something. What I have done, I am proud of the work that I have done. 